My name is Emma DeLockery. I've been an environmental student in Colombia for the past six years. Back in 2019, I attended a workshop by the South Carolina Aquarium about plastic pollution in our local waterways. I was shocked by the pervasiveness and severity of this issue in our community. This was only amplified when I started doing my own litter sweeps and collecting data. So I started to think of this as a scientific research project. I started wondering, what's the extent of plastic pollution here in Colombia? And how did this become such a large issue for us? What happens to our plastic waste when it ends up in landfills or the natural environment? And how does our plastic waste in Colombia make it to sea in Charleston? I also wondered, what's the extent of the plastic pollution problem in Charleston? And what are we doing to combat this? My desire to answer these questions started my journey to track down people engaged with this issue and actively working to fight it. And the results led me to this. Plastic is, is just such an ingrained part of our lives now that most people don't even think twice about it, um, but it's having serious impacts on our waterways. Pretty much right where we are right now, years ago, I mean, I remember it was really shallow water, and so I remember grabbing a, uh, a beer can out of the river. It was just sitting on the, on the bottom and something moved inside of it. And so I cracked it in half and a catfish swam out. It was a juvenile catfish had swum in, gotten too big to get out of the mouth and was gonna essentially live the rest of its life stuck in that beer can. And I just happened to grab that beer can that day. My name is Bill Stangler and I am your Congaree Riverkeeper. I've been running the organization for about eight years now. Congaree Riverkeeper works to protect the three rivers here in the Midlands, the Broad, the Saluda, and the Congaree. It's 90 miles of river. If you add up the tributaries in our watershed area, it's more than 2,000 stream miles, uh, portions of five different counties, and a population of more than 600,000 people. Plastic pollution is a, a serious problem that we're seeing and, and uh, you know, something we started noticing on our cleanups a couple years ago was just how much plastic, single-use plastics we were finding. Whether those were plastic bags that we see, you know, littering our rivers and creeks and stuck in trees, and we were picking up plastic bags by the hundreds on these different cleanups to plastic bottles, plastic food containers, wrappers, all sorts of things like that it's a serious problem you know it's not just an aesthetic issue where you see it at a at a park or if you're going you know kayaking or tubing and it you know it doesn't look good it's a it's an environmental concern and we know that these plastic items break down into microplastics they're being ingested by animals uh, so we know that there are longer term consequences than just seeing the litter and, and these things are just everywhere So my name is Bill Stangler. I'm your Congaree Riverkeeper. I appreciate you guys coming out to do a cleanup with us today. Um, so when folks come to our cleanups and they spend, you know, an hour or two with us in a creek or along the river, 
uh, they no longer have a question about is there a pollution problem, is there a litter problem, is there a trash problem, they know. And one of the things that we encourage is that now that they've seen it and observed it, reach out to your local leaders, your elected officials, um, you know, organizations that you work with, even just your friends, neighbors, family, and, and let them know that you saw that, that it's a concern of yours. Spending time in these urban streams where you're seeing that, or even just taking a boat out and running down the Congaree River right here and seeing, you know, a hundred plastic bags dangling from tree branches over a river that I care about and spend a lot of time on is, is a real push to want to take some action and try and, and, and fix this problem. It, it, uh, it gets a little down when you feel like you're just picking up after people all the time. But uh, part of the Riverkeeper job is, is, you know, holding other people accountable and cleaning up messes. Right, well, I'll shoot down and uh, try and catch all those plastic bags. Yeah. military weapon becomes tomorrow's peacetime instrument. Plastics will play as large a role in peace as they do in war. Here is a plane containing hundreds of plastic parts. Here another bonded by plastics. This paratrooper floating down to welcome Mother Earth is depending on plastics to get him there safely. His parachute is made of nylon, a plastic. As for plastics in peace, here they are in our homes, augmenting our comforts, serving our needs. Plastic, plastic, plastic. It's this rapid adaptability, together with the attractiveness, usefulness, and low cost of the plastic itself, that has made this industry one of the fastest growing in the nation's history. The future of plastics is bright indeed. Of the 5.8 billion metric tons of plastic waste no longer in use, only 9% has been recycled since 1950. 79% has accumulated in landfills or the natural environment. When you dispose of plastics, you have two options. One is to throw it in your trash, the other is to recycle it. If you put it in landfill, it'll pretty much be put into the landfill covered and stay there for hundreds of years probably because it doesn't, won't break down in the absence of oxygen and uh, light. It's unlikely to break down very quickly, so it'll be probably sitting in the landfill for a really long time. The world of plastics is present everywhere. Yet this presence is but a premonition of a future world. Our children will see a bit of that world, and our grandchildren will not see the end of it. In terms of plastics and the rise of their use, plastics are inexpensive, they're versatile, they're lightweight, and they're durable. And in fact, all of these qualities that make them great for single use also make them terrible for the environment because when they get out in the environment, they're lightweight, they're versatile, they float, and they take a very, very long time to degrade. I'm Dr. John Weinstein. We are look overlooking the Ashley River here in Charleston, South Carolina. I've been an environmental toxicologist for about 25 years, but my interest specifically in plastics and microplastics started in 2013. So I've been looking at it for about six or seven years now. Tell me about your data. So this is my oyster, mm -hmm. St. Helena 3A tissue for number four. Plastic waste persists for so long because these polymers, these long chain polymers, are not something that are normally found in nature. 
So there are no microorganisms, or I should say there are very few microorganisms that are able to use that carbon for energy. They don't have the enzymes to break down that polymer. And so, you know, the plant material that surrounds us, those are also made up of long chain polymers, but the microorganisms located here in the marsh are adapted to using that for energy. Plastic, not so much. Decomposition or degradation of plastic waste has been reported to occur at timescales of years to decades. In the aquatic environment, organisms at every level of the food chain have been found to ingest or interact with plastics. The plastic, because it takes so long to degrade, is just going to continue to accumulate in, in these beautiful areas like the salt marshes and our estuary. It's going to continue to accumulate within the middle of the ocean, having impacts on sea turtles, for example. But it's also going to degrade into microplastics, and those microplastics are already making its way into our food supply, but it's even going to be greater in the future unless we act now to prevent that plastic litter from getting out to the environment. South Carolina is a relatively small state, and we are, in some respects, a living laboratory in that everything whether we recognize it or not, is connected in some way, shape, or form. We are here on the banks of the Congaree River. A lot of folks may not realize that what we may purposefully or inadvertently put into the Congaree River can make its way to Charleston Harbor. We have the Congaree River that flows through the Congaree National Park, which then flows through Sparkleberry Swamp. The waters then flow through Lake Marion and Lake Moultrie, which are the Santee Cooper Lakes. They drain out the Tail Race Canal, go down the Cooper River, enter Charleston Harbor, and literally we can put something in the water here, and it may wash ashore on the banks of Charleston Harbor adjacent to the South Carolina Aquarium. For example, we have a, a careless person going across the bridge right here. They inadvertently have some trash that flies out of the back of their pickup truck, including plastic uh, drinking bottles. They end up in the river. They begin the process of breaking down so we have a local impact. As they move their way, hydrology comes into play, water flow moves it down. It may actually fill up and sink to the bottom and begin to break down locally or it may meander its way through the, the Congaree, down through the swamp, end up anywhere along the way, including all the way to the coast. So we need to realize that our activities here can have very far-reaching effects and consequences. drowning in plastic down here. So, I mean, you see some of these pictures from other parts of the world where the shorelines are just littered with debris. If you took away all our Spartina grass and you just had a rocky shoreline here, that's what it would look like. Right now, it's out of sight, out of mind, and our job as water keepers is to bring that issue to the forefront and highlight it so people really understand what we're dealing with. I'm Andrew Wonderly, I'm Charleston Waterkeeper, and we work to protect and restore Charleston's waterways so you can fish, swim, paddle, surf, sail without fear of pollution. Uh, you know, Charleston's beautiful salt marsh hi hides a dirty secret. It's all, it's all full of plastic debris. So this section of marsh here on Town Creek is known for collecting a lot of the debris that ends up in the harbor. If it floats, we'll find it here at some point. And so we end up finding a lot of plastic debris in here. Citadel did some research a while back and found that the five most common types 
in our local waterways are, are bottles, bottle caps, styrofoam, uh, plastic bags, and food wrappers. And so what do all those things have in common? They're all single use items. They're all convenience items. They're designed to be used once and then thrown away. You know, you get them cheaply with your purchase and then they're designed to be cheaply discarded. And so we see a lot of that here in our local waterways. Let me see what else we got here. This is the remains of a styrofoam cup. We find styrofoam like this all the time. The Citadel's done some research, four to six weeks, right? This starts breaking down into microplastics. And you can, you can see, I don't know if you can see, but I can, I can feel it on my, on my fingers, the way this is starting to deteriorate if you just rub it a little bit. You know, you kind of get little bits of grit, grit and grime, and it's almost like powdery there uh, in my fingertips. But I mean, this, you know, the, the marsh here is gonna, is gonna be full of this. Pretty classic bottle that's been in the marsh a little while. Right, you can see that it's already starting to foul. So you, you're getting this, this uh, biofilm growing on it, right? And so that's, uh, you know, a film and bacteria that are starting to break this bottle down and, and starting to, you can feel too how this one's a little, a uh, little brittle, but this one, believe it or not, probably hasn't been here all that long. Where the built environment and the natural environment meet is typically where you see that condition where you just have a lot of plastic debris. And that's because this stuff, it's not, it's not coming from somewhere out there, it's coming from here. It's coming from on land and ending up in the water. It's coming from all of us. Blown out of the back of the boat, blown out of the back of the pickup, overturned recycling bin. It takes a wind, you know, windy day, rainy day, and it just all ends up here. In the marsh, it ends up out in the water, and then it gets stuck in the marsh. So It all ends up here eventually. This type of marsh environment is some of the most biologically productive environment in the world. And, you know, to see it littered with all this plastic debris just in here breaking down is really sad. Right? You just don't find this everywhere, and it's really special. Um, it's just really special. The only way I can describe it. A lot of people do ask me how I don't get depressed working in, in this situation because it doesn't seem to be getting any better. But you know, I see so many little wins and, and enough to keep me fed um, and to keep me moving forward. My name is Kelly Dorvelson. I'm the Conservation Programs Manager for the South Carolina Aquarium. When a sick or injured sea turtle is found along the coast of South Carolina, the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources is contacted and those animals are transported to the South Carolina Aquarium. Unfortunately, over the years we've seen a dramatic increase of sea turtle patients coming in with plastics in their GI tract. In 20 years of treating sick and injured sea turtles, we've had 38 turtles come in with plastics in their GI tracts. It's a substantial number, but 33 of those were just in the last five years. Some of our patients come in with uh, impactions, and those can be caused by plastics, but some come in for different types of injuries, and then they pass plastics while they're in our care. I would say that single-use plastic material is like like that of bags is probably the most common type of plastic that we see. But you know we've seen electrical tape and balloons and you know band aids and hard plastic. I mean we've we've certainly seen all different types. Plastic, yeah, yeah. plastic, candy wrapper, okay. plastic wrapper, yep. straw wrapper, yep. This was with that, okay? Okay. Um, mask. Yep. The Litter Free Digital Journal is one of the aquarium's citizen science projects that allows individuals and communities to track the different types of debris that are littering their communities. By knowing what the most problematic debris items are, it helps to have the conversations around solutions. 
litter sweeps without data collection um, are helpful in removing litter, but not in finding solutions to the litter. If, if there's no data to back up what these issues are, the litter is just showing back up the next day and the next day. When we have data to back up the litter sweeps that are happening, uh, we can have conversations with the businesses and our, our elected leaders and ultimately inform plastics legislation to really deal with the issues. I think a lot of people don't understand that we, there are solutions to it and that's where the data comes in. When you start providing numbers to back up what we're talking about, these litter issues, that's when people really, um, it's almost like a wake-up call. That's when people become a little more aware. The one thing I talk about is how, and I've heard this so many times, people will say, the problem is so large, there's nothing I individually can do. And that's not, that's not true. Every individual can do something. And based on my research in Charleston Harbor, knowing how many microplastics are produced from even a single plastic item, if you go out and you just pick up one piece of plastic litter, you are preventing hundreds of thousands of microplastic particles from being released into the environment. So just picking up that one item, you're making a difference. Now imagine every time you took a walk, you picked up one item or two items or three items, how much of a difference you would make. Litter wasn't a big problem when I was young and I just want my children and my grandchildren to have you know the same experiences I had. You didn't hear about wildlife washing up with guts full of plastic like you like you do now and and that and that is that's a regular sort of news item um, along the coast and I think we just we have to do better. So you know the old Thing was reduce, reuse, recycle. You know, that was a jingle. It was always on those commercials and stuff. Um, but that's got to shift. And I think the first thing now is refuse. You've got to refuse the plastic bag when you go to the grocery store. Bring your own reusable bag. You've got to refuse the plastic straw at the restaurant. And over time, that's going to change the attitudes of businesses. It's going to change the attitudes of other individuals. And we can move beyond plastic. You know, this problem it's not coming down the road from Ohio, right? This problem is from us. It's from all the people that live here. It's from the people that come here and visit. And we've, you know, we've just, we've got to do a better job, right? We've got to keep this stuff. We've got to take action to keep this stuff out of the consumer stream, but we also have to take action to educate folks about what the problem is because it, we just can't treat our waterways this way. When we were talking about plastic pollution on our social media page, someone said this, and I think it was particularly apt, is if we don't solve this problem, we might as well change our, uh, our state flag to a tattered plastic bag waving in the wind, because that's what we're going to see on every tree branch down the street and along the rivers everywhere we go. If we don't take action, we're, it's just going to keep happening, and it's going to get worse and worse. And so this is kind of, we're at this tipping point, and maybe we're a little bit beyond it. Um, but this is the moment to, to try and do something.